Ron Amon Ra Lawrence is one of the most prolific music producers in the entertainment and recording industry. The star studded producer has sold over 30 million records worldwide. He's best known for his earlier work of popular singles by Big, producing the smash hit Hypnotize, Puff, Been Around the World, Jay Z, Where I'm From, The Locks, Money Power Respect, Faith Evans. Love Like This, and LL Cool J's Phenomena. In his college years, where I first came across him, Ron and Derek Angeletti formed the rap group Two Kings and a Cypher and released the album From Pyramids to Projects. Later, Amin Ra joined the Hitmen producer squad by Bad Boy Entertainment, along with fellow Howard University alum Sean Puffy Combs, raised the bar for the rap and R&B era of the 90s, leading this hitmaker to receive the New Horizon Award as producer of the year. Today, I sat down with Ron to talk about his career and his return to Howard University homecoming as music supervisor of the 2022 event Bison Honors, which I'm really looking forward to, and I'll be there. Take a listen. Ron, where are you from? I'm from New York City, East Elmhurst, Queens. I graduated from William Cullen Bryan High School in Woodside, Queens. I originally started off in um, high school of music and art. I lasted there two years and then I transferred out because I was messing up. In those last two years, obviously you knew that music was a passion of yours. You grew up in an era where hip hop was the language of our, of our people. Yeah. When you got into your junior and senior year and started thinking about what I'll do after I graduate high school, what was that conversation in your head and what was the conversation in your family? Well, I wanted to be an architect. I used to draw. I grew up as an artist. Everybody knew me as a kid that knew how to draw in a class. So I always drew cartoons, I drew superheroes, I drew anything you could think of. That was my thing. Just wanted to be an artist. Right. And then when I got into hip hop, um, that kind of took a back seat. But I wasn't really looking at hip hop as a career. Because mm-hmm. I come from an educational background. My mother's a school teacher. Mm-hmm. She taught honors in math. So the whole education thing was very strong in my household. And I couldn't tell my mom I wanted to be a rapper. She'd look at me like, yo, boy, is you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> you can, you're going to college. So that's, right. that was already set. So I knew that's what I had to do. My last year in high school, I took an architecture class and I aced it. And the teacher was like, you need to be doing architecture. So I, I went to school for architecture. So when you were choosing schools to go to be an architect, what were the schools that you were thinking of? I had one foot in the rap game and one foot in school because I still wanted to rap. So then that's when I applied to Howard. I said, All right, you know what? I need to change. I need to figure out what I'm going to do in my life. I knew just being in New York City, I needed to have something different. I needed to drive. Mm-hmm. And, and Howard was the thing. What year are we talking about? What year do you well, leave New York was, and come to D.C.? I left New York in 86 to come to Howard. 1986, you're about, what, 18, 20 years old? Yeah. What was something that was definitely in your tape deck when you were in New York that last year, 86? Uh, Eric B. is president. That Eric was B. the hottest record on the radio at the time. So when I came to Howard, everybody was was losing their mind to Eric B. is president. The whole right. campus, everybody was doing a WAP. It's just, that was just the thing. Were you concerned about at all the idea of leaving the New York culture and what it might be like in D.C. being a whole different city? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I was kind of saddened because I knew it was going to be different. It ain't mm-hmm. like it is now. Right. New York at that time, that was a city where if you was there, you knew that once you left, you was missing out because mm. it was a city like no other. There was so much going on as far as the hip hop scene is concerned. Nobody else was really doing it like that at the time. So I felt like I was missing something. Right. But I really needed a change. I needed to find myself. I was I was kind of lost. So this is a total departure. This is a young dude leaving yeah. what is the center of the universe to go someplace else. And you choose DC and Howard out of all those places. I know that had to be scary. What was it like landing day and week one? In DC. When I first came to Howard, it was different. It took a little getting used to. Here I am in this town 
coming from New York and then just seeing how the local scene was, the go-go music, I wasn't really into that at first. Mm-hmm. Um, walking into McDonald's, they had mustard on their hamburgers. We didn't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it was just a little different. We were rocking Tim's. They were rocking these lizard boots, like right. lizard, lizard construction Tim boots. They were, <laughs> they, were fun. they were like, they come up to your knees, kind of like, you know? Right. So the whole street scene was just totally different. They had these little tiny little baseball caps. They were like little, like made for babies. Mm-hmm. And they were rocking Go Go Mickey shirts. And I remember the whole drug deal scene was big at the time. And just being on Howard campus, that was like our safe haven. I knew I was there for a purpose. I talk about New Orleans and DC being two very special cities. These two cities are very musical cities. They have their own sound, their own flair, their own style of music. And it starts from the young kids who learn how to play instruments, learn how to play percussion, learn how to play horns. And it fuels the city sound. Coming from Queens, landing in DC in the late 80s when Go-Go is way more prevalent maybe than it even is now, how did that impact your your sense of music or your taste in music or even your the sound that you would eventually come to create? Yeah, well, what it did was I started listening to the production. I started getting into the sound. Mm-hmm. And I, there's a good friend of mine. His name was Herbie Lovebug, and he lived... He was from my neighborhood, East Elmhurst, Queens, and he's the one who created the whole Salt and Pepper group. Right. And he didn't play and all that other stuff. So I, w- I started sending him go-go records. I would listen to the beats and be like, yo, check this out. Like there was this record called Sardines and Pork and Beans. Mm-hmm. And then he would take them and then he would use them. Right. And uh, one of the records ended up happening to be My Mic Sounds Nice. So that was kind of like the beginning of knowing that, hey, maybe I could actually do this. Yeah. That's incredible. I had no idea that, like, everybody knows that Herb was the guy who brought the go-go sound into hip-hop. It's actually you. <laughs> you sending Herb stuff. Yeah, I contributed to that. Definitely <laughs> did. They used to come to visit me at Howard University. They loved coming to Howard. They loved homecoming. They just loved the whole scene. Mm. And they fell in love with their whole go-go vibe. So now I'm in D.C. I'm at Howard. Who are you meeting where are you spending your time? What, what does that look like? I was entering the talent shows. I did the freshman year talent show. I rapped on that. I bought Salt and Pepper and Dane and Dane to Cranston Auditorium. So a lot of those artists that I knew from back home, when they came to D.C., they would come to Howard's campus and I would take them around. Like when Eric B. and Rock Kim came to Howard's campus, I would bring them down to Blackburn. You know, The, the pivotal point for me was, um, and this is crazy. I went to, when I decided to create Two Kings in a Cypher, I, I, I stepped to Dida and I stepped to Half Pierre and, um, and said, yo, let's, let's create a group. Let's, let's, you know, we, we all like hip hop. Let's do something. Mm-hmm. And Dida was more serious. So when it came to the meeting, Dot showed up and Half didn't. So we, we formed Two Kings in a Cypher, and I went to the administrative building and took out an emergency student loan for $600. At the time, they had these emergency student loans, $600, and I went to The Wiz downtown, and I bought this big boombox with two microphones, and um, that's how we started. We, we started working on our demo and living in Slow Hall. That's great. The hilarious part is you have to actually stop right now and explain what The Wiz is. The Wiz was a record store back in the 80s. It's gone now, but that was probably the biggest record store at that time. Nobody right. Beats The Wiz was a slogan. If mm-hmm. you know that Bismarck record when he says, nobody beats the biz, nobody beats the biz, that was the commercial. Right. Nobody beats The Wiz, nobody beats The Wiz. I would go into The Wiz just to look at the credits of records, just to see who produced certain right. records or who wrote certain records, just being in awe, just being able to see the label and see the credits and, and just look at the artwork. Man, that was mind blowing at the time. And I, I would live in those record stores. I would live in the Wiz. Mm. And Derek thought I was crazy. And I, you know, when I look back at it now, that was kind of crazy to go in there and just take an emergency student loan just to buy a damn radio with two microphones, but I was thinking long-term, I was thinking, well, 
That's Ain't right. nobody else here to help us create some music. We might as well do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So you, you launched Two Kings in the Cypher. You reached national at least because I heard of you before I got there. Like I had the record, right? This is in Jersey. Right. You're off in D.C. I get your record. I got the single, which is, you know, so you're, you're out there. Just talk about the development of your career from there. Who are the key people you met in D.C.? Who are the key relationships you had that started to really turn this thing into a real thing that you could do? You got Derek and Harv. Those are partners now. Yeah, Derek. Yeah, Hawk Islam. He's the one who founded Drew Hill and, and Maya. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if he was studying law. But he was at the time he was A and R and at Philadelphia International Records, and he was a Howard graduate. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, Rhonda Berry, brought him to my dorm room. At the time, I was the first, the first, and only person <laughs> with a drum machine. Mm -hmm. And I lived on the East Towers, and I used to bang out those beats so hard that people used to come to the dorm room and see what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And cats would be lined up just to be seeing what was going on there. Ron brought Hawk in there and he witnessed, he sold my drum machine, the MPC 60. He heard the beats and was like, yo, I want to sign y'all. Like, what's up? That was a pivotal point for us because then he took us to Philadelphia International and we got to meet Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, and all the greats from Philadelphia International Records. And then we started traveling back and forth to Philadelphia and uh, started working on our demo. Right. right. Also at Howard, of course, Sean, Sean Puffy Combs, who's known as Diddy today. You know, Puff and I, we used to hang out, go to New York, go to parties together. I took Puff to his first studio session in New York City. Of course, you know, Harv and mm -hmm. Mark Pitts and all these dudes who are in the industry today. Uh, that was my connection. That was the, the, the cast that I knew before everybody made it big. Right. Chris Latimer and so many right. of this. Right. Yeah. And then you go on to work with and still work with, I'm sure. And I don't want to short you and act like this is the entire list. This is the top, let's say, 15 that I pulled of artists that you've placed your hands on in some ways. I got Shy, Terra Squad, Rakim, Luther Vandross, Aretha Franklin, Biggie, LL, Brian McKnight, Jay Z, Tracy Lee, Boys to Men, Puff Daddy and the Family, Mace, LSG, Backstreet Boys. I'm sure the list is probably three times that long. And now, we're 2022. Howard Homecoming is this phenomena. Why is it so important that Bison Honors is happening? What is it about, number one, Howard, and what is it about Bison Honors that attracted you to want to come and do this thing? I think it's important that we don't forget the people who have done so much for various industries, you know, whether it's politics and music and film and it's how it has done so much. And I think it's time that we start acknowledging and giving flowers. You know, you, you had Donnie Hathaway, Roberta Flack, and these, this young generation may not even know who these folks are, but these artists, they paved the way for us. Right. You know, the Blackbirds and, you know, going to Howard and just knowing these people were there. And I think it would have been great that if we were able to honor them. Mm -hmm. especially Donny Hathaway before he passed. The people need to know how great how it is and the greatness that's come from this college and the impact that it's made over the years, you know, and why people love Howard so much. It's the most talked about homecoming in the country. Yeah. And just, I mean, I just, I remember during the pandemic, they said Howard University was the most Googled homecoming ever or something crazy like that. But. I mean, you know, when you step on Howard's campus and you just, you just think about the history of all the people that's come from there, it just blows your mind just to look at the history. And then you say to yourself, it's, there's something special about this school. Like, what is it? Like, is it the food that they're eating in Blackburn? Like, what what are they drinking? What are they, what, what, what is it? <laughs> right. it? I'm trying to figure it out myself. <laughs> But it's like, it's something magical about this school that if you know that you go there, then sky's the limit for you. Whether if you want to be a doctor, if you want to be some kind of entrepreneur, you make it big. I mean, right. like, the, the proof is in the pudding. Right. You're the music supervisor for Bison Honors. How do you approach that? What is the message? When you're thinking about what I want this event to sound like, what are the feelings that you're aiming for? What are you looking for? 
feel good music, impactful, uh, stuff that I like that I think that everybody else would like, you know? I believe that it's got to be something that touches the soul. Yo, I'm coming to Howard's Homecoming this year, October 22nd, to celebrate Bison Honors, and I hope to see you there.